barriers in PDD in this Diagnostic and Statistic Manual, DSM, which is the psychiatrist's Bible. It's a coding. So because it's coded in the psychiatry literature, it's thought of as a psychiatric disorder. The problem is, this is not, your kid's not crazy. This is not a psychiatric disorder. It's like depression, actually. Depression is, quote, a psychiatric disorder, but a lot of times there are many, many biological bases for depression. The same thing with this. The reality is, this is a biological disorder, a medical disorder, okay, with behavioral correlate. So we define it behaviorally. We don't have any special test that diagnose autism. You can't get like a culture of the throat and say, oh, they've got a strep throat, it's positive. You can't get a culture and say, oh, they've got autism or they've got PDD. It's defined by behavioral characteristics, impaired social interaction, impaired social communication, markedly restricted repertoire of activities and interests, or repetitive behaviors, you know, right? That's, it doesn't take, really, I mean, it takes a developmental pediatrician, a pediatric neurologist, neurologist, but the reality is it, to see a kid who's frankly autistic, it doesn't take, it's not that difficult in a lot of ways to, to have a sense that some, a child's on the spectrum. So we define it behaviorally, but underneath it, it's biological. And there are a lot of medical features associated with it. There are seizures in almost one third. Sometimes there's cognitive deficits, but other times you have savant-like skills, brilliant. A lot of the kids I see are very much different than the kids they used to think of as, oh, a child with autism, and probably a lot of you can relate to this, is mentally retarded. It is so far from the truth. The kids that I see, and I may see a skewed population from around the world, but the reality is the kids I see are not only gorgeous, most of the kids are just gorgeous, but they're also brilliant. They're very, very smart. This is not this image of, you know, of a child who's really, really, really low IQ. Some of them have cognitive deficits, but many actually have savant skills. They're really, really amazing in some areas. And what I think of simplistically, if you understand, in a lot of ways, their neuronal circuitry is blocked. It's incoherent. It's not working the way it's supposed to be. So part of my job and that of my colleagues is to unblock those circuitry and help it work much more coherently. And that's part of what the recovery process is. They have sometimes sensory and motor abnormalities, immune impairments. I'm going to talk to you about a lot of times they have problems with the immune system. We call it immune dysregulation. Gastrointestinal, GI distress in 50 to 75 percent. And food allergies, sensitivities in over 50 percent. So there are lots of medical problems. And although they look different, and that's what this word phenotypes mean. This is how it presents. Underneath you are your genes and how you look. When you look at the person sitting next to you, you're seeing their phenotype. You see how they look and certain behavioral characteristics. So they're there. Not every autistic child is the same. As you know, even from a behavioral point of view, you have the child who's totally mute, nonverbal, withdrawn. You have the really aggressive subtype. You have the really hyperactive, scripting, stimming subtype. It goes on and on, right? We presume they're heterogeneous biologically, which means that we presume that the things that are contributing to them on the biological levels are different. They're not the same. Homogeneous means it's the same. Heterogeneous means it's different. And there are no accepted biomarkers to identify autism. There's no, you can't get it, you can get an MRI, but it's not gonna say they're autism. You can get a EEG, it's not gonna say autism. It might show seizures. You can't get a culture of blood test that says, oh, this child has autism. It just doesn't. Okay. It's an active area of research, and after I made this slide, uh, which I've had for a little while, this is, this is a recent publication uh, in an alternative medicine review journal that uh, talks about biomarkers, using biomarkers to guide interventions, which is what we're, we're looking for, because the key is they're not all the same biologically, and one size doesn't fit all. And the problem out there, and is that too many people are trying to do the same thing with every child. And they may get a few successes, but it doesn't really, it doesn't address the needs of all the kids. This is an article by Brad Street and Rosignol, and basically it's saying that autism spectrum disorders are associated with numbers of things I'm gonna to talk to you about. So oxidative stress, too much uh, ox oxidants, these are, these are 
very unstable molecules that attack cells and create cellular chaos, and they attack the organelles within the cells and the cell membranes. Decrease methylation capacity. These are all things you're going to learn about. These are big words now, and I don't expect. You're not going to get tested after this. I, so you don't have to worry. You can take a deep breath. I know there's a, a lot, you know, I'm talking to some of my friends from Hong Kong and Singapore. I know there's a lot of pressure out there for even the kids to perform and everybody to perform. This is just for you to take it in, soak it in. Uh, I know there's some doctors out here as well, so I have to speak at a level that doctors can understand as well as people, lay people. So uh, if you don't understand every word, it's okay. It's okay. You need, this is not, you need to work, find yourself someone you can work with as well to help guide you because these biomarkers, low levels of glutathione, dysfunction of mitochondria, those are the energy centers in the cell that make energy for the cell to work. And you don't only use energy when, uh-oh, uh, you had too much coffee, you have to go pee and you run out. You don't only need the energy to run to the door and go to the, uh, well, the loo or the john or whatever we want to call it here. Um, but you use energy when you're sleeping. Your cells are using energy 24-7. It's for the ingress or bring nutrients in, the egress or bring waste out. You've got to detoxify toxins in the body 24-7. You gotta clean up the mess. It's like you gotta mop up the floor of your kitchen or your helper mic, whatever. You need to you need to repair the if there's been some kind of a, a virus and there's an attack, you have to repair the damage. These are all happening while you sleep all the time, and you need energy to do these things. So the mitochondria are 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 uh, affected. In the gut, there's things that are abnormal. There are abnormal floor, there's inflammation. There's an there's a increased permeability, it's leaky, we'll talk about these things. And then there's increased toxic burdens, both chemicals and heavy metals. There's dysregulation of the immune system. All of these things, uh, and plus uh, unique inflammation in the gut. These are all things, including immune activation of the brain. There are certain cells in the brain that get activated, and they cause all this inflammation. A lot of the children actually have inflammation in the brain. So there are various biomarkers that we're learning about that we can actually look at and then try to uh, see from our history, our physical, and our labs, what is being involved more in one child, what is being involved in another. And the, many of these problems are common features in children with ADHD as well. You see the overlap. You're gonna see a lot of this overlap and try to drill it into you to just have you understand. And lastly, with this whole thing of biomarkers, if you can use these various biomarkers, you can measure oxidative stress, and methylation capacity, and transsulfuration. Again, I'll show you some slides on this. This is a lot of medical stuff. It's hard to understand. This is biochemistry. I'll show you a slide that, that when I show it to the doctors, they're going to look and say, oh, yeah, maybe I remember that, but I, I never thought I'd need that again in my life. So this is what, this is, it's, it's going to come back to one thing. This is good. Uh, um, you can test immune function. You can test gastrointestinal problems. You can test the flora. You can test inflammation. And you can look at toxic metals. And if we use these biomarkers, the reason we want biomarkers, they can be useful to guide selection, efficacy, and sufficiency, or the right types of biomedical interventions. In other words, a child comes in and has a sore throat. Is it viral or is it strep? Well, if it's viral, it doesn't need an antibiotic. If you don't, in the old days, a lot of times they wouldn't even do it, and they just put kids on antibiotics, which, and we overuse the antibiotics, which is a problem. And you know there's a whole thing of antibiotic resistance, and then there's all the problems with yeast overgrowth and anaerobes and problems. So we know now if you do a strep culture and you see the strep, that needs to be treated with an antibiotic, but most of them are not. Most of them are viruses. So that strep culture is a biomarker for strep. So we now have biomarkers for various of the things that are involved in autism. Nothing is diagnostic of autism. I want you to understand that there's no biomarker that says this child has autism, this child has PDD. But there are evolving biomarkers that allow us to help differentiate the various subgroups, which I'm going to talk about in a second. The key to remember is that autism is not psychiatric disorder. It's a biological and or medical disorder. And really, it's not just a brain disorder. It's actually a systemic inflammatory disorder that also involves the brain, okay? It's not just the brain, even though we think that. 
It's a systemic disorder, generally thought of as an inflammatory disorder, most of the children, that also involves the brain. And the dysfunction in autism is neurologic, with a subcomponent of neurotoxic in many of the children. GI tract, the metabolism, and the immunologic systems are all involved, and we're going to get a, a sense of these things. It's important to recognize this, because as you try to heal the children and, and, and recover the children, you can't just attend to the brain. Because sometimes you'll see a kid that is really, really behavioral problems, and you treat their gut, and lo and behold, the behaviors get better. And I'm going to show you some slides of this. And it's very profound, so very important to understand this. So what is the working hypothesis as to what's going on? Okay, we said, okay, what the heck is going on with our children? That one in 91, does anybody know the figures in Singapore? Anybody have those figures? Singapore, Hong Kong, the, uh, the incidents of autism? Okay. If anybody finds that out somehow, I'd be curious if they could get it from that. I'd love to, to get that. Because um, I know this is worldwide. In England, it may even probably a little bit higher. Um, and, uh, you know, I know it's increasing in Australia. I don't have them off the top of my head, but they're, they're you know. So the working hypothesis is that autism spectrum disorders arise from a combination of what? Genetic predisposition. So all the money in the States for years has been spent on genetics, genetics, genetics. But what did I say to you? There is no such thing as a genetic epidemic. So what, what does make sense, and what is thought to be happening, and this is a quote, working hypothesis, but many of us in the field that I work in really feel this is what's happening. It's a combination of genetic predisposition, genetic vulnerability, genetic susceptibility, as you will, coupled or combined with environmental insults or triggers. So neither one is enough. Because you say, well, heck, why is not every child, you know, every child in Hong Kong or Singapore is, is going to be exposed to a lot of the same environmental insults, so why is it only in certain kids? It's because the genetic predisposition. And the primary underlying genetic vulnerability appears to be in many children an impaired ability to detoxify. And these environmental insults include toxins such as heavy metals, lead, mercury, you'll see these, pesticides, other chemicals, the plasticizers, as well as food sensitivities or allergies and infections. These are the kind of things that may be affecting the kids in conjunction with their genetic predisposition. And do you understand that? It's very important. This is the underlying hypothesis that I'm going to present to you. And I think there's evolving and emerging more and more research to support this for sure. And this is just came out pretty recently, published in Current Opinion and Piaget. I'm going to show you some, basically by this Philip Landrigan from uh, Mount Sinai, who's very respected in the field of toxicology and children's health. Again, just saying, suggesting uh, that the early environmental exposures also contribute. In other words, that genetic factors, mutations, deletions, copy number variants in genes are clearly implicated in causing autism. But, however, they account for only a small fraction of cases. And millions, billions of dollars have been spent in research for these small fraction of cases. And still so much money is going to that. And what is finally coming about, as we get more and more people on board saying that they do